Welcome, welcome, welcome to the living room where we listen, learn, and live together. I want to thank you so much for joining us today, and I hope that you make yourself right at home. In his last speech, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said these famous words, like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. True words have never been spoken. We all imagine and fantasize to a great degree about what it would be like to live a long life. Well, today I am excited to have a conversation with not only someone who has lived long, but lived well, and I've had the opportunity to serve as one of his pastors. Our special guest in the living room is Mr. Fred Thomas. How are you, sir? Fine, thank you, and you? I'm doing very, very well. It's good to see you. It's good to see your face and hear your voice, sir. Thank you. It's been a while since we left the Maryland area and I have fond memories of our time together. One in particular is that every Sabbath, every Saturday, I would look to my left when standing up at the pulpit and see you dressed to the nines. <laughs> <laughs> oh my. Yes, indeed. So let's start from the beginning. Uh, when were you born and where were you born? I was born at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, Maryland in 1924, November the 1st. I have a fellow November baby. You know, my birthday is November 19th. Very good. My wedding, my wedding date was November, the, I mean, November the 20th. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. No, I didn't know that November uh, is a is a great month. So I didn't. I also didn't know that you were you're actually born in Maryland. Yes, I was. Yeah. Okay. That's my home. Now, did you grow up as an only child, or did you have siblings? I had two sisters, which both had passed. Okay. But uh, my my father died when I was four years old. Hmm. So I lived with my grandparents, and they raised me. Okay. And what did they do growing up? Well, my grandfather was a contractor. He built houses, churches, and uh, work of that sort. Okay. And, and he had a few men that worked with him. Yes, sir. But he, he wasn't born in Baltimore. He was born in North Carolina. Okay. Yep. My parents were born in Florida, and my grandparents were born in Georgia. And I was born in Florida, so a lot of my beginnings and my roots are down in the southern part of the United States. But for oh. you, your grandparents born in North Carolina, and were your parents born in North Carolina as well, or were they from just Georgia? my grandfather? Okay, just your grandfather. My grandmother was born in Baltimore. Okay, so what was it like growing up in Maryland and in Baltimore, coming up through the twenties and the thirties into the forties? <laughs> well, it used to be very good when I was young. Hmm. But um, of course, now I'm afraid to even go over there. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Times have indeed changed. And did, have you lived in Maryland your entire life or did you move away and then come back? When I got married, I moved out of the city. Okay. And uh, I lived in uh, Millersville, Maryland for about 40 almost 40 years. Okay. Okay. Now, where did you meet your wife? What was her name? And how did you know <laughs> this is the young lady that uh, is going to be my bride? Well, I was going to, uh, to college, Morgan State College, to make some credits because I had applied to go to a New York University and I needed some more credits. And I met her in my classroom as I went to school to, to, to take up my different subjects. And uh, I found out she lives around the corner from me. And that's how we started off. <laughs> I carried her books home that first night. Okay. <laughs> and what was her name? Grace. And there was Grace Ann Simmons. Okay. Well, I'm grateful that she lived not too far from you. And when were you all married? I know November 20th, but which year? 
1948. Wow. November 20th, 1948, a whole 40 years and before, a whole 40 years before I was even born. Can you believe that? <laughs> well, I, I guess I got a couple years on you. <laughs> yes, you do. And that's all right. And how long were you all married? We were married 66 years. Wow. We dated for two years. Okay. And then we got married and we were married 66 years. The year she died would have been our 67th year. Wow. And so you all literally spent most of your lives together. Yeah. Yeah. That's, That's right. Amazing. That's amazing. Um, I remember uh, pictures being shared with me upon Kyla and Kyla and my arrival at Brinklow. And one of the things that was so beautiful is just the pictures of you all together, hanging together. <laughs> um, and you were very kind enough and open enough to share with us and the midweek prayer group, you know, just the, you know, the challenges of adjusting and transitioning to life without not only your wife, but your best friend, the mother of your children. How many children did you all have together? We had six children, three boys and three girls. Okay. Amazing. And how many grandchildren and great grands? Do you have great grands? I have great grands. I have three. I have three grandchildren and four great grandchildren. Wow. So let's let's put it in perspective. You're born in 1924, here it is, 2020. You were married 66 years, six children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Back in the 1930s and 40s, did you see your life unfolding like this? <laughs> no, <laughs> things were a little different. And people were different then, you know. Mm. Uh, I never thought that, but I, my ambition was to be a pilot when I went in the military, but that didn't happen. <laughs> hmm. And so what branch of the military did you serve in and for how long? I served in the army. I went in in 1943 and served until, and came out in 1946. Okay. And so if I'm not mistaken, that was a season of war as well. Yeah, well, they, uh, when I came out, we were still at war with Japan. Okay. But then I, I, I was in the European uh, section of Europe in the mm. war. And uh, I was getting ready to go to Japan okay. because the war hadn't ended. But what happened, the war ended and I went back to Germany in the Army of Occupation. Hmm. So I served a little more time over in Europe than, and I didn't go to Japan because the war had ceased over there. So I've only heard about, of course, that war in reading it in books, hearing documentaries, watching documentaries. Um, and so Hitler and his regime, of yeah. course, many people and historians have, have painted him as you know, this dictator and, and I think that's what he was, but going through it and hearing about it, being a part of the armed forces and just as an American citizen, what was the talk then? What were the newspapers saying? Was it really clear that this guy, he means no one any good at the time? Oh, definitely. Mm. He, he was out to kill all the Jews. Mm. And while he was rampaging over in Europe, uh, six million Jews died under, while he was uh, a dictator. Wow. It, it, it was horrible. I've mm. seen so much over that. It's just, it just was, was horrible. Mm. So what about being a, an African-American soldier? Was your time fairly good? I've heard various stories, even serving here in the Tidewater area in Virginia, where there are a lot of military um, retirees and veterans who have said some have had positive experiences being black men and black women in the armed services and others haven't. What about yours in the 40s? Well, I didn't want to go into the South when they called me, when mm -hmm. they drafted me, because I'd heard so much bad stuff and I'd seen some things about them lynching people and all. 
I wanted to stay north, but they sent me to the south. <laughs> yes. And uh, it wasn't good. Uh, when I was in uh, Alabama, my company, a uh, black man was killed in the car. The police had tied his hands behind him. And one got in on one side of the car and one on the other. And on the way to wherever they were going, they killed him. Mm. And said he tried to escape. So the company I was in, the fellows got together and marched into town. It was a little town called Gadsden, Alabama. And uh, another time when I was moved from the Alabama to Louisiana, another incident happened like that. And uh, the tank destroyer company, which was mostly black, not the officers, but the men, because they still discriminated and they went into town and shot the town up with those tank destroyers. Mm. So the next day, they sent all the black fellows in the tank destroyer unit over to Japan. Wow. So it wasn't it wasn't a pleasant job. Mm. So On the funny side, if I could tell you, we were moving the troops to another town. And we stopped in a place, and I saw a sign of it said Philadelphia. And I jumped off the train and was shouting. I said, oh, we're in Philadelphia, because I thought it was up north again. And the guy said, that's Philadelphia, Mississippi. <laughs> I burned some cement getting back on that train. <laughs> I didn't want to say that. Uh, this is not the Philadelphia I want to be in at all. No. <laughs> so I want to thank you for your service, for your years in the Army. Um, I know it's been many years since then, but you are one of many persons who contributed to uh, much of the freedom that we uh, enjoy. Um, yes. And you bore the weight of, I'm sure, even more stories and more experiences beyond what you have shared. Um, so after you got out of the military, what did you do? Was this, did you go to Morgan after the military or before? What, what was life like post-military? Well, I applied for, uh, to go, because I, uh, New York University, you know, was out in another state. But I had 18 credits, but they only accepted 14. Mm -hmm. So I had to go to night school to, to earn more credits. But uh, I wasn't married then. That's where, where I met my wife going to, uh, to a night school to get more credits. Okay. And when you, did you end up graduating? No, um, I met my wife. Okay. That, <laughs> that, became, that became school. <laughs> and uh, we dated for two years and then we finally got married. Okay. So when we got married, college went out the window. All right. <laughs> sure. so. Now you mentioned you have six children. Uh, what are the names of your sons and daughters? Well, I have five that are living. Okay. My oldest son, he passed. Uh, his name is Frederick Jr. Then I have one named Gregory. And uh, the oldest daughter's name is Denise. I think she's married. She's married to her elder, Pastor Hayden. Okay, sure. And another daughter was uh, Cecilia, which is the one I'm living with now. And then another son called Brian, and my baby daughter named uh, Alita. Okay. Awesome, awesome, awesome. So growing up, Mr. Thomas, did you develop any gifts and talents, whether sports, musical, writing? Or did you pick up any hobbies that you've carried with you throughout the years? Well, I liked music and I used to write. I wrote my first poem when I was in the fourth grade. Okay. <laughs> and uh, I've been writing poems through the years and I have quite a few written. And uh, But my ambition was to be a pilot in the service and I didn't get to be that. Hmm. So, I got a job, I think I worked with the government for social security. Okay. And uh, then I 
had, had to work for the second army because there was more money. Mm -hmm. And then I transferred from the second army to the post office because it was a few dollars more. Mm -hmm. So money was, was the um, motivator, I guess you call sure. it. But uh, I've written some music. I was I was playing learning I was taking piano lessons, but uh, my teacher turned out to be a little different okay. from what I thought it should be. And I told my grandmother, and she told me, "Well, don't take lessons anymore for him." And my piano lessons stopped there. Mm. Well, I've had the chance to hear not only some of your musical pieces, but I have in my personal collection uh, some of your poetry. Oh. Fact, you sent me um, the Awakening Poem. You remember that yeah, one? Yeah, that was my last poem I've written. Yes, indeed. I just wrote that a few weeks ago, about yes, a indeed. month ago. I have that here. I have that here with me in my collection, sir. Yeah, I see. I see it. Signed by you. <laughs> I, I want to read I want to read a few lines here that really were compelling to me. And it says here, so read your Bible and in your heart prepare some room. Never has a sign since the flood affected the whole creation. And that's being felt so seriously by every tongue and nation. Stop the killing of God's children by evilness and hating. For he has prepared a place of love for all and is now waiting. So on your mark, get set and be ready to go. Because all the love and glory of heaven, God wants us to know. Study the Bible's history with its words of future events. And finally resolve why to the world Christ was sent. A lot of your poems and music has a very intentional focus on faith, on God. And so... Why does that inspire you? Have you always been a person of faith, a man of belief? What over the years has served to deepen your relationship with God? Well, I've been a member of church since I was about five years old. My grandmother took me to church. Well, then I went on Sundays. Mm -hmm. But I've been in church, my church, then the Adventist church, all my life. Okay. Every week I'm at church. Mm. That's why I miss being out now. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Mm. So I want to ask you, in terms of American history, you have come through different seasons in American history, through the 20s and the 40s, through the civil rights movement, on through the 70s and 80s with the Afros and bell bottoms and soul train and, and Not that. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of a lot of the um advancements that came in the 90s and all the way now into the second decade, uh, really now into the third decade, we're pushing towards of yeah. the 2000s. So when you see a lot of what's going on now, like you said, times were different then. How has, how has that been? You know, like for myself, I was born in the late 80s, 1988. I consider myself to be a child of the 90s. And for the most part, my life has just been rapid technology advancement. You know, we started off with flip cell phones and I remember yeah. cordless phones and now we have touch screens, but you've seen even more technological advancements, right? So how has that been for you growing through the different seasons of American life, whether that's technology, whether that is interpersonal relationships, black and white people. Um, and then all the way leading up to now, we have had not only the first black president, first African-American president of the United States. And now we have the first African-American, first Asian-American, first female vice president-elect. Sure. Seeing these, yeah. things, what do these milestones mean to you? Well, it shows an advancement, but it's not complete yet hmm. because there's still a lot of racism going on. Because I, I was one of the first black farmers in Baltimore City. Wow. And uh, what happened, it was two of us that passed the test and they, they rejected us because they said he was too fat and I was too thin. Wow. <laughs> so they gave another test. And when they gave another test, they just called us back. 
but the other fellow never went back. So, and I went back and I was going to school there, but the Sabbath became the problem. Okay. And uh, they wouldn't excuse me. So I had to leave. Mm -hmm. So I went back to the government. Mm. So I've heard a lot about personalities like Martin Luther King Jr., Malcolm X. What are your yeah. recollections of their contributions and others coming up? Rosa Parks. Yeah. Well, I was aware of all of that. And I, I was very proud of Martin Luther King. Hmm. I was just sorry the way he he's ended. Sure. But, uh, and of course, um, there was, I forget the lady's name who sat on the bus. Rosa Parks? Rosa Parks. I forget some of these things. <laughs> I can't remember everything now. Yes, sir. But I remember her sitting on the bus when they uh, arrested her, you know? Yes, sir. And um, I, I, I followed the black thing. As a matter of fact, I was keeping a uh, a diary, not a diary, but a book of pictures and things of the way the blacks had been treated through the years. Mm -hmm. And it goes back to the 30s. As a matter of fact, they had a group of uh, a bunch of boys called uh, the, um, oh, what are they? They, the rest of them all said they raped some white woman or something. Mm -hmm. And they hadn't touched the woman. And they, they put him in jail. They were going to jail him for life and all. And I, I followed through all that. And I kept a, a record of a lot of that stuff. Some of the pictures I have still. Mm -hmm. But uh, that was in the 30s. Wow. And uh, in the 40s, we still had uh, uh, racism because when the war started and they were drafting soldiers, we were blacks in one part of it, uh, uh, where, where we were stationed. They were on one side, and uh, the whites were on another side. Mm -hmm. And all of the officers at that time were white. And uh, finally, they put a black officer in, in my outfit, but uh, he went in as a first lieutenant. Yes, sir. Yeah. It's, it's a lot of things have happened. I can't remember all of it as it, <laughs> you know. I, I understand. That's okay. That's okay. So you were married for 66 years. Uh, I've been married for going on six years, just five and a half, five and eight months, oh, in fact. Oh, um, you need it. You need it. <laughs> it's, it's 10 more. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So. Yeah. In your mind, in your experience, is there a secret to a long, successful marriage? What contributed to you all making it that long? Well, I can say I loved her. <laughs> and love is what kept me there. Yes, sir. You know, Amen. Mean, no marriage is perfect. But uh, we had a very good, we had a very good marriage. Awesome, awesome. I was and looking forward to being married 70 years. <laughs> I believe it, I believe it. So as you near, you're four years away from a milestone that again, many people, and right now, as you know, I'm 31, I'll be 32 in, in, a, in a few weeks here and I'm looking I'm looking like 40 seems a, a long way away, but you're about to hit the big three digit number 100. <laughs> Mr. Thomas, Brother Thomas, how do you feel as you near 100? What, what does that, what are you thinking about? <laughs> well, in my prayers, I asked the Lord to show me why he has allowed me to live this long mm. and what is it that he wants me me to do or be mm. and uh, and I pray that each day that he shows me and some people said you know talk about the letters I write poems you know 
and things like that. And I guess that's what it is because I've been writing since the fourth grade in right. elementary school. So I believe it. I believe it. They say that the, the longer you live, the more of life you come to understand. Uh, certain questions that you might have been wrestling with in your 20s, maybe somewhere in your 30s or 40s, you no longer wrestle with those questions. Have you seen it be true that, you know, the longer I've lived, my focuses have changed, um, things I might have been worried about in my younger years, I no longer worry about. Is that true? Or is it like, no, you know, certain questions, they, they last a lifetime? Well, the one question that's really been in my mind is why do we have racism? Mm. We are all human beings, God made us all. And yet there's an element in society that just hates the other group. Yeah. And I can't understand why. Yeah. We all walk on two feet, we have two hands, a mouth, the ears and all just alike. And our blood is red, but still there are groups that hate each other. Mm. And that I can't figure why. Because it, it 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 just seems obvious that we should all be you know, alike together, you know, understanding each other and friends. So. I agree wholeheartedly mm -hmm. that something so illogical and unsensible yeah. has the fuel to maintain itself. When you're right, we walk on two feet, we see through two eyes, hear through two ears, we have one mouth, 10 fingers, 10 toes, um, and yet something uh, like color, instead of us being able to appreciate diversity, and variety, yeah. it does become this, this divisive thing that really has plagued our nation and different pockets of the world for so long. And uh, I agree with you wholeheartedly. That is a question that I still have. And uh, I know myself and others are committed to continuing to try to bring an, an end to it, um, yeah. especially as young people coming up behind me, younger people even, um, can grow up in a world where this does not exist. Brother well, Thomas. Go ahead. No, I'm listening. Well, in addition to what you just said, when they had that uh, Floyd thing, uh, the George Floyd. Skills, yeah, Floyd George. There were quite a few white people in the group that mm. were demonstrating. That's right. You know, which in the 30s you would never have seen that. Mm. Yeah, maybe even in the 40s because uh, when they stopped discriminating in the military, it was near the end of the 40s. I think it was around 47, 48, somewhere like that. Mm -hmm. That they dropped the discrimination part in the military yes. so they could all stay together. Okay. So you, you, um, you recently stopped driving. Yeah, I, what happened, I fell. Okay. And off some steps with one of my friends, and I did a somersault. Oh, wow. And I messed up three of my fingers, and I turned, my daughter said, <laughs> turned topsy turvy all the way over. Hmm. And uh, since that time, my legs have been sort of trembling, when, like when I dress and all. Yes. And I got to thinking, if I'm driving and that happens, I might step on the gas accidentally okay. instead of the brake and hit somebody. Okay. So I was thinking, I don't want that to happen. And I didn't want to give up my license. So what I did, I sold my car. My son took me down and we sold, sold the car. Okay. I missed the car, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'm glad I'm not ever out there driving having an accident. Yes, sir. I remember, I can see it just now. I remember you driving up in your car and, and I always thought to myself, I never said this, but I thought, you know, I definitely, like you said, if, if I can be as safe as possible and have my bearings, yeah. I want to be able to, you know, maintain autonomy, do for myself, right. drive myself for as long as possible. Sure. And so I want to ask you a few questions about that, if, if you wouldn't mind. Um, right now, I'm a young man 
And as you know, when you're in your youth, you have a great deal of ability. You know, you take a lot of things for granted. As you have grown through life, as you have aged, has that been a challenge for you at all on a, on a maybe a thought level? Like, man, I, I am not, I can't do what I used to do or I'm not as young. <laughs> how do you, how have you managed that over the years going from one decade to another, leaving your forties, going into your fifties, seventies, eighties, and now nineties? Well, it didn't happen until after I got in my eighties because I used to get up on the roof, fix the roof, Clean the gutters out at 80, in my 80s. Wow. Now I can hardly get up the steps, okay. <laughs> three or four steps. <laughs> so okay. that's quite a difference. And I feel like I could do a lot of things, but when I try, I can't do it. Okay. So I just have to sit down and I have to program my brain to say, you can't do that. Right. <laughs> so, and what it, about? Growing, no, please go ahead. No, that's all right. I was going to say, now, what about now relationships? Because you remember all six of your children being born, you raised them, they listened to you, you told them what to do. Is there an adjustment now? <laughs> <laughs> kind of having to listen to your kids, and they're, they're not telling you what to do, but they're saying, Daddy, you know, here's what we want you to do. Yeah, well, that happens when I think, <laughs> but I, I don't talk about that too much because I don't want to upset them. Sure. So I'd probably go along with the program. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. When you look at your grandchildren and your great grandchildren, what do you want for them? What values do you want them to develop? Um, you know, what would you hope they would take away as they look at you, you know? Well, I hope I've been a good example to them. And I know some of my grandchildren are not spiritually, have been spiritually act, uh, you know, able to attend or they're not going to church, you know. And mm -hmm. So their spiritual life is very nil. Okay. But then I have two other grandsons who are in college and they have been in church all their life. Mm -hmm. But they live in Tennessee. Okay. So, but they, they listen to me when I talk to them. Mm. You know, whether they're following through, I don't know. Right. Because I don't see them that much because they, they don't come around to see me, you know. Mm -hmm. Because it's easier for them to get to me than it is for me to get to them. Right. How have you been processing this pandemic that has been going on? Uh, I've been treading it like I'm walking on cotton. Mm. <laughs> because I don't want that to happen to me. Yes, sir. But you know uh, that you mentioned that when uh, earlier, several months back, I got sick I was in the bed and I was just talking to myself, something I, 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 I'd gone to the hospital, I think that's what it was. And uh, I kept calling on the Lord, take me away, take me away, take me away. And I was like, I was out of my mind. Hmm. And I don't know what happened to me at that time. And I'm wondering, and I think one of my children mentioned that I might have had a touch of that pandemic, the flu, the, the, flu, um, the coronavirus, the coronavirus, mm. and didn't know it. Mm. But I was in the hospital for four days. But then I, when I came home, I, you know, I kind of got back to my senses. Okay. But uh, I'm very careful. I, I wear a mask, and as a matter of fact, I wear two. I yes, put sir. one on, and then I have a plastic one that goes over the top. My daughter bought me two. Okay. And I try to stay away from crowds. And I hear you on that. I hear you on that. Yeah, it is uh, unprecedented, um, at least for me in my lifetime. I, I've heard about pandemics. I've heard about epidemics. But to be in one and for it to have shut down 
uh, the world as quickly as it did yeah. down to sheltering in place, um, staying at home. For us, you know, back in March, we were at church one Saturday and then it was yeah. shut down. It shut down, I remember. Yeah. For it to go as long as it has, um, I miss the fellowship. I miss being in one another's presence. And um, I appreciate you sharing how it, it, it hits us all, I think, in different ways. And then it, yeah. another way, all of us are hitting the same way. Um, and so my, my prayers are often going out to those whose families have been impacted on, on a personal way. Yeah. Brother Thomas, do you have any of your poems or musical lyrics near? <laughs> They're on the bed. I was just looking. I got two books of poems. Uh, Boosie. Oh. Right, my daughter's back in her bedroom. Boosie. And I you... have so many poems I haven't even put in my books. Wow. I got papers and they, they on me about getting rid of some of the paper. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, I have one right here. Uh, one of my poem books. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll give you, you take as much time, read whichever ones you're, you want to read and share with us. You can let us know what inspired them, um, when they were written. Take as much time as you need. Well, <laughs> I got so many. I don't know which one to really get. I got one called Love's Ways. Mm -hmm. uh, concern. Uh, I had so many. Thinking clearly. This that one sounds good. Thinking clearly. Maybe I'll read that one. Okay. It says that there are some groups whose thinkers is not too clear and their me methods of operating are by ignorance and fear. Some are caught up dealing with alcohol, drugs, and crack. And for them, survival seems the lot of thugs without the facts. Sorry to say it, but things, but thugs' names they will retain while letting the poisons of alcohol and drug cook their tiny brains. There is a power that enslaves men as crooks. And needless to say, his deception is cunning as with drugs he hooks. Saying no seems easy enough when spoken as a phrase, but some need more than just a phrase to free them from the maze. Questions now so pointed, where will this madness stop? at a point of no return or a bullet from a cop. How blind we are in this day of mirth and light to be fooled by drugs and greed, thereby losing our sight. We need the ability to see the plan is working with such speed, wiping out a generation that has forgotten how they were freed. This is not meant to be racial, but the need must be addressed for youthful blacks are killing each other. Man, is that a mess? I'm afraid for this group of people, their future looks mighty bleak as they race in anger and rage, taking innocent lives on city streets. How to end this tragic senseless waste of precious life is the paramount question as we come to grips in the drug fight. Surely we are not blinded into thinking drug traffic is just a game, hiding the true facts that the influence of money is ruling the game. Many, many hearts have been crushed by drugs, cruel acts of selfish, unthinking people hooked on cocaine and crack. If you are proud, of your race and the greatness we have attained, assert your actions and vocalize your hatred of cocaine. Mm -hmm. Remember the little engine who said, I think I can, I think I can, 
as you climb the hill and gear your life and priorities as you fight drugs and say, I know I will, I know I will. Thinking clearly. Yeah. Wow. Wow. So, you know, you've seen in various pockets of America, um, many of our black brothers and sisters, as well as white brothers and sisters and brothers and sisters of various hues and um, communities get hooked on drugs. Yes. And I know that for not all, but some even of our veteran community who came out of very war-torn environments, just not even being able to articulate all that I saw, whether it was in Germany, Japan, Vietnam, sometimes that was a route that was taken. Yes. What and who prevented you from going down those pathways of drugs and alcohol? Well, thanks to the Lord, <laughs> I've never tasted alcohol, drugs, or any of that stuff. Mm -hmm. I, in the army, they gave us a carton of cigarettes, each soldier. And I traded mine off for candy. Amen. <laughs> so, but what I found out, they were selling my cigarettes for money. <laughs> and leaving you with the candy. Leaving me with the candy, yeah. But uh, it's never crossed my mind mm -hmm. because I lived in a family where a lot of my members drank alcohol mm -hmm. and I hated it. I just hated it. I just grew to hate it, you know? And, uh, and it has affected my family a lot of them because of the drinking. Yes. So. Yes. I can see traces of drugs and alcohol in my family. I'm sure many of us can, and that does, at least it can help you kind of steer your life a different way. And like you said, I believe the Lord is good in that not only does he keep many of us from those addictions and from sampling and, and participating, but also he delivers that we have friends and family members who you know, have that as a part of their past, but thankfully it's not a part of their present and that those changes can happen. Now, I don't know, I, I, maybe I'm being a little selfish, but I heard another title in there called Love Always. Was that it? <laughs> I want to hear that one too. Love's Ways. That's what Love I mean. Ways. Can you share that one? Yeah, let me get it. Get the light. I'm having a little trouble seeing it because the light's not within my reach. Okay, it says Love's Ways. When I perceive the glory of the elements above, my thoughts go out to ask, why such a display of love? Mm -hmm. And then I think of you, my dear, your wit and your charm. And the next desire I have is to hold you in my arms. Mm -hmm. Sort of love one. <laughs> uh, in the sun, there's a brightness and and degrees of radiant heat, ingredients much needed if love is to be complete. The moonlight, eerie softness, prompting words, I love you, as stars sparkle like diamonds amidst a canopy of blue. How much I'm aware of love's kin to nature's grand array, then with suddenness of thought, I muse, I must love someone today. <laughs> then with suddenness of thought, I mean, <laughs> as God shells the earth with beauty from above, we should do likewise here to those we love. There are no rules that fashion love as just for man alone because there are myriads of people to whom love must be shown. Just as God shows his love in every rock and, and climb, we need to have that characteristic with us all the time. Turning to my spouse, I gently kiss the cheek to let my partner know that closeness I seek. The children, to children, a hug, a kiss and waiting arms 
well, they too need to be known, need to know that love has charms. And to every other being created on this earth, extend a hand of love with firmness and mirth. And while we liken love to an itch of the heart that can't be scratched, let's make Let's emulate to all the, the love of God that can never be matched. <laughs> Brother Thomas, yes, <laughs> sir. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful, beautiful words. Um, I do believe that words have power. In one of the letters that you sent to me, you actually mentioned the power of words, but also the limitations of words. Um, this is August 3rd, 2017. And you say, you and your wife have made an indelible, life-lasting impression on my heart. And because of only 26 letters in the alphabet, I have no other tool to let you know how deep this impression was. <laughs> now, now, you were talking about the limitations of words, yet using words to yeah. impress upon us <laughs> how much uh, we mean to you. And, and the sentiments are so mutual. Um, you mean so much to us, and I'm grateful because you mentioned racism earlier, and, and a part of what stings about racism is the way people use words to harm other people. Yeah. Um, name calling. I mean, yeah. we don't need to go into all the details, but words can really, really do damage, but yet yeah. you throughout your life have used words to heal, to uplift, to change. You have crafted wonderful prose and poetry out of those 26 letters yeah. um, for your wife, for your children, for others. You've shared it in church. You've sent me letters and shared poems with me. Um, for, for, for a young person who is listening right now, maybe even a fourth grader, and they're listening to you, um, or a 14-year-old or a 20-year-old, what would you say to them about the power of words? Well, the power, there are only 26 letters, but they're so powerful, you can't c communicate with anybody unless you use words. <laughs> and you can show your love in words, mm -hmm. in 26 letters. Mm -hmm. Some people show it in three or four letters, mm -hmm. three or four words. I love you, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I, music was, part of my hobby, I guess, or something I like to do. Okay. And I've had uh, one piece was uh, used in the motion picture back in 1984. Really? Yeah. And uh, I've written a concerto. Mm -hmm. I think it's about 20 pages long. Okay. And uh, I've written some spiritual music. And some of it I presented at uh, Brinkelow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so. Now there was a piece that I believe it was A.T. Wesney played at Mrs. Thomas's Celebration of Life. Do you remember the name of that one? Oh, no, I can't say I remember. Okay. But I do recall that being very powerful that there was an original piece played and, and sung, um, written by you, and played and sung by, I think, A.T. Wesney at that time. Uh, what was that, Bucci? You know? Huh? What? What is it? What? The song was sung at your, your mother's funeral. A.T. sang it. Um, I know. Your song? Yes, one I wrote. I don't know what did it start off with an I. Uh, was it this chick ain't nobody soon? What? This chick ain't nobody soon? <laughs> See, <laughs> and we, that's the song I wrote years ago. It says, this chick is nobody's fool. <laughs> <laughs> it may be this one that said, I will not say goodbye, my friend. Mm. Yeah. I said, I wouldn't to say goodbye, my friend, for I hope to see you again. Uh -oh. 
Yeah, I, I wrote one. It, I, uh, several people have used it at, at a funeral. Mm. But I can't remember which one it was. Mm. I can't remember half of the titles I wrote. I, I just have to turn to them. I believe it. I believe it. Do you have <laughs> Do you have a rough estimate about how many songs and poems you've written over the years? No, never even tried to count them. I'm sure it's, it's innumerable. I, I, it, I don't think it's a thousand, but it's it's a couple hundred or sure. more. When you're writing poetry, do you um, do you just kind of write freehand, or do you kind of craft an outline and then go back and write? How many drafts do you go through, or does it just come how you want it when you write it the first time? Well, it just comes to me, okay. like the one uh, the one you just read at the beginning, but the the uh, but the pandemic and all. It just something came to me one day and said, it's a mess out there. Mm. And why the world is in such a mess. So I, that poem came to me, you know? Yes, sir. And, and I figured God was trying to send us a warning here through the pandemic mm -hmm. and the mess that's going on in the world that he's coming soon. Mm. And I sat down and I just wrote it. Okay. That was it. But sometimes I'll write a few lines and put them away and go back again and look at them and then I'll write something according to that. I've got a lot of pieces of paper around there <laughs> with stuff on it. I'm trying to get rid of some of them. My daughter thinks I have too much paper. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, did you have, do you have um, favorite poets from over the years? Was anybody's work that you particularly like to read? I used to like Paul Lawrence Dunbar. But that was back in the 30s and 40s. Okay. But uh, I had a book of his poems, but I don't know what happened to it. Mm. But I like the poems he wrote. Okay. But his poems were mostly around being black and being mistreated and things like that. Mm. I don't know whether you've read any of his poems or not. I haven't read a lot of Paul Lawrence Dunbar, but I have heard of him. Yeah, um, and I'm sure I've read one or two of his works, but I haven't immersed myself in his in his works. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was going to ask you. You pastored for a while or for a short stint in Glen Burnie, Maryland. Yeah, it's funny you said that because I was just looking at a couple of the sermons that I had given during that time. Which I think I was pastor there for seven months. Mm. We didn't have a pastor, you know. Okay. What was that experience like? Well, the people liked me, but several people, it was an all white church. We were the first blacks there. Okay. And uh, several people, they didn't like us. Mm -hmm. And one fellow, he was trying to find something wrong with us. Mm. And I had a pianist and an organist there because I, I started the first choir they had there. I had 25 members on the choir. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he would put notes on the piano to the pianist and make remarks, you know, and things to get her set. Mm -hmm. And she showed me some of them. And uh, I have a letter from her she wrote to me years ago, back, way back then. And uh, she told me not to let it worry me, you know. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'm 31 years old. I am. Uh, 69 years away from 100. You're four years away from 100. <laughs> okay. Any final thoughts, any life lessons? Um, in fact, if you, would, if you wouldn't mind, I actually have two questions. Before I ask this one, let me ask this one. Um, is there a place in the world that you always wanted to travel, but you didn't get a chance to get to? No, I, I think I've traveled to places that I wanted to go. Okay. And I've been out of the country, mm -hmm. halfway around the world. Okay. And so. Do you have a favorite place that you travel? Ocean City, Maryland. Okay. <laughs> My wife and I used to go there every summer. We'd go and spend, uh, you know, three or four days or a week. Okay. We just like the place, you know. Sure. So. Sure. So here was my last question. Um, any other life lessons or core values that you want to pass on to me and by extension, anyone in my generation that we can take with us as we grow through life? That's a big question. 
<laughs> well, I found this out in living that God has loaned us a tool, which is his word. And there's no better word, better tool, no stronger way of trying to communicate with God than through words. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do them out loud. You know, you are in the silence of your bedroom or or your wherever you are. And I, that's the way I look at it. I, you gotta count God into everything. Awesome. And if you don't have him there, it's like not having all your teeth in your mouth. Mm. <laughs> That's excellent. <laughs> That's excellent. When you were courting your wife, Mrs. Thomas, um, mm. before she was Mrs. Thomas, were you nervous when you asked her family if you could marry her? <laughs> yeah, her mother didn't want me to marry her because I was an Adventist. Okay. But I was going to church with my wife before we got married. Sure. Yeah, I enjoyed the church. I'd studied the Voice of Prophecy lessons. And uh, at the same time, in the church I belonged to, they wanted to make me, uh, what they call, not an elder, a steward, that's right. Okay. And a steward in the church in the Methodist thing was the same as an elder in the church in the Adventist. Mm -hmm. And he said, we want to make you a, a steward in the church. He said, you got to let me know. And I put it off. And then one Sunday he said, well, what do you decide? You know, I said, well, I think you better name somebody else. Mm. And after that, I went on to my, you know, my wife's church and then I joined. Okay. Awesome. Yes, I remember being very nervous myself when I was asking my wife's family for her hand in marriage. I had heard so many stories from other men. I'd heard my dad's story asking my grandfather for my mom's hand in marriage. And so when it's your time, it's a different kind of nerves then. Yeah. <laughs> it, well, it is. I, I told her mother, I said, I'd like to marry your daughter. But she, she didn't say she didn't disagree. She said, oh, it'd be so nice if you were an Adventist. Mm. That's what she said. And I made up my mind that I wasn't going to join the church then mm -hmm. because I wasn't joining the church because she made me join. I wanted to join because I wanted to join. Yes, sir. But it wasn't long after that that I, I went up front, got baptized, and been there ever since. Okay. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Well, thank you, Brother Thomas. I appreciate your time, sir. I appreciate you and I hope I didn't take too much of your time. Not at all. Not at all. I've been looking forward to this all day. <laughs> yeah. I you appreciate know, you, sir. I, I like to be young for this reason. Mm -hmm. I see all the hair that you're growing around your chin and I don't have none on top. <laughs> oh, well, well, well listen, I'm, I'm going to remember that. <laughs> And I'm going to be very grateful when, when I'm combing my hair and, 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 and getting my shape ups. You know, this pandemic has, has, has been a challenge, but I'll tell you what, I've been cutting my hair, um, learning to cut my own hair. Um, oh. I've, sh I've shaved, used a razor for the first time. And yeah. oh. uh, so I'm trying to get better at that and save a few dollars in the process. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I got a razor. I shaved with that one razor, okay. and it's not electric. It's just as, you know, double-edged razor. And I've been using it for the last month or more. Mm. And I shave every morning. Okay. Because the hair grows overnight. It sure does. That morning shadow was something else. Yeah, yeah. My hair grew. But I had a full head of hair up until my 60s. Okay. And then it started thinning out, you know. Mm. I got a little bit in the back there. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, it was a pleasure talking to you. Likewise, sir. I hope the I hope the rest of your evening goes well. Thank Aunt Bootsy for me and Tisa as yeah. well for her help. I do appreciate them both. Yeah, she's sitting in the other room, in in the living room. Okay. Well, listen, would you mind closing us out in prayer? Oh, oh. Father in heaven, we thank you for the wonderful gift of life that you've given us whether it's long or short. 
as long as you're in it, we know that we're safe. And keep our love going for you and for our family and loved ones. And may the day that you come be very soon that we can enjoy the gift of walking the streets of heaven with you. And we ask you to take care of Pastor Martin and his wife, guide and protect them in his ministry. And one day, one day, we as saints will join the army of God and be there forever. And we look forward to that. And we thank you for that privilege. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Brother Thomas. I love you, sir, and I appreciate you. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, too. Yes, indeed. All right. It was a pleasure. It was a pleasure, really. Likewise. I kept, you know, I kept you laughing because that's one of the things I like to do. I believe it. And on Sabbath, I have everybody laughing that I talk to because I say things, you know, like I told you about your beard. Yes, I indeed. saw you laughing. <laughs> yeah. Fantastic. Brother Thomas, it's been a true joy and a privilege just having a conversation with you. I thank you for- Same here, same here. Allowing me to ask you some questions for sharing your thoughts and a part of your life with us. Um, we are better because of it. And to you, our viewing and listening audience, we thank you so much. And I hope that you have taken all that we have listened to from Mr. Frederick Thomas, who is 96 years young. <laughs> who has shared with us the secret to marriage, just keep loving your spouse, the value and the power of words. And I'm grateful that the Lord has allowed us to have this opportunity not to talk, but that we know each other, that, that our lives mm -hmm. intersected yeah. when they did. I'm praying for you and your family that God will continue to keep you in good health uh, throughout mm -hmm. the remainder of this year. And um, we thank you all so much for listening and for watching. That's all we have for this episode of The Living Room. Make sure you continue to listen, continue to learn, and continue to live. We'll see you next time. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you.